Greetings, everyone. This is Ayman Tarabishi with the International Council for Small Business, and this is the ICSB Exchange uh, webinar series. And I am the president and CEO of ICSB. I'm also the deputy chair of the Department of Management at the George Washington University School of Business. Today's ICSB Exchange um, webinar series is titled Towards Industry and Society 5.0. I am really excited about this title. I'm really excited about the material that's being presented here. Yesterday, our webinar was on entrepreneurship and the arts, and we continue the theme, but in a more comprehensive and more inclusive way, looking at tor towards the industry and society 5.0. I am really honored, and, and, and he's really put a lot of work and effort on this. We have exchanged multiple emails, many emails, and multiple Skype conversations and he's, he's prepared. You'll see from his slides and he, is, and he is presenting from us from beautiful Greece that he's spending time with us. And it's a, I think there's a heat wave there. So he's, he's spending some time with us to present his slides and his presentation here. I am delighted and honored and excited to introduce my colleague and my dear friend, Dr. Ilias Kerianis. He is a full professor of science, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship, as well as the co-founder and co-director of the Global and Entrepreneurial Finance Research Institute, GFERE, and director of research on science, technology, and innovation, and entrepreneurship for the European Union Research Center, URC, at the School of Business at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Dr. Kurianis is a teaching and research in teaching and research activities focused on the areas of strategic government, university, industry, R&D partnerships, technology, road mapping, technology transfer and commercialization, international science and technology policy, technological entrepreneurship, and regional economic development. And he, he, has, one of the, he has a lot of fascinating areas of research that he does. And he's globally well known and he's renowned. I have colleagues from Italy reaching out to me to talk about the work that he's doing here. So, and we are just delighted to have him here with us on this webinar series. And also a little bit about Ilias Kurianis. He's a really good tennis player. I played with him and I, and I lost many, many games with him here. So, um, so be careful when you play with him tennis. Dr. Kurianis, we are delighted to have you here. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. And Thank you, Ayman. Thank you. I, I was wondering, I was going to mention the tennis, uh, not in this manner. I was just going to say we <laughs> playing uh, tennis back in the 90s when we were both starting at GW. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, it's been, in fact, next, next uh, August will be 25 years I've been with GW. I was just uh, thinking. Yep. And yep. indeed, currently I'm... Um, uh, in Greece, uh, partly because I have family here, but also because of the COVID situation. Uh, and hopefully this will be resolved soon. Now, it's been a real uh, pleasure and a good opportunity for me to connect with you and your audience uh, through what you're doing. This is great. Um, I have been, in fact, involved in uh, related areas, both in terms of research and teaching. And so tonight we'll talk about uh, a little bit uh, industry uh, point oh concepts and how that leads into the next generation, so to speak, or level, Industry and Society 5.0, as the title indicates, but also other related areas uh, and concepts. Um, and this, by the way, uh, as you, I think, indicated, is a series, meaning there's going to be follow-up presentations that will build further and go into more depth and breadth into this uh, this this, uh, this set of concepts and ideas. Um, hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, this is uh, the abstract, the summary of what the webinar series is about. Uh, we talk, as you see, about the, the concept of the innovation helix frameworks. They build on the triple helix concept that many perhaps are aware of, and I and others have been uh, the creators and authors and researchers of an extended version, the quadruple and then the quintuple innovation helix frameworks. In effect, the triple helix uh, focuses, builds on government, university, and industry as the main pillars of the knowledge economy and society. And we added, we thought, 
in addition to these top-down policy making and practice defining uh, institutions and pillars, it's very important to remember and engage and organize, in fact, embed in the planning and the interaction of civil society, whether it is non-governmental organizations or just citizens, that can also be innovators and entrepreneurs. So this is a bottom-up uh, uh, influence and pillar. And then all of these, as you will see with the schematics that will follow, and we all exist both on the same planet and of course the, around, within the environment. The environment, natural environment surrounds us. So uh, these are very important considerations and these are the five dimensions of the helices. Now there's gonna be a discussion of AI as an enabler and shaper of trends and transitions from industry 4.0 that we'll see is a more technocentric uh, set uh, of standards and configuration of designs to a more balanced, technocentric and human-centric uh, set of concepts and ideas. And in fact, uh, Ayman, you're working a lot and you have a lot of uh, activities, research and speakers and other webinars about humane entrepreneurship and so forth. This is what this is in many ways about. So this is uh, the uh, title of the webinar today in more specificity that is part of the webinar series, the ecosystem as helix um, towards industry and society 5.0 via the quadruple quintuple innovation helix lenses. Um, and before we proceed, uh, just a brief comment and reflection on what innovation is, the phenomenon of innovation that undergirds and, and shapes and drives again all these activities and transhuman endeavors, as well as uh, uh, industrial scale uh, transformations. The innovation is a very uh, profound, nonlinear, complex, and dynamic phenomenon that has socio technical, socio economic, and socio political dimensions. And as Machiavelli said centuries ago, uh, again, interestingly, based in Italy, that uh, I'm referred to before. He, the innovator has fair enemies, all who have done well under the old lukewarm defenders and those who may do well under the new law. Uh, in a more um, scientific academic context, if you wish, uh, one is reminded of Thomas Kuhn and the structure of scientific revolutions, where he, he uh, expounded on the idea that any paradigm shift or scientific revolution, we can be well experiencing one with this uh, resurgence, because it's not new, of artificial intelligence applications and implications, um, that you have a lot of resistance to a new emerging paradigm until suddenly it becomes, and if it is to be, of course, established, it becomes established enough and then everybody considers it's a given and they don't really uh, are able anymore to realize why was it that it was not so already. Um, but those who have made it happen know very well how hard they tried, of course. So just a brief, Ayman asked me to reflect also and, and share with people uh, some thoughts and some comments briefly about different areas of research activity. I will not go into these at this point in more detail unless someone has an interest, but there are at the macro, meso and micro level different projects. They primarily focus on the nature dynamics and structure and implications for policy and theory, policy and practice, in fact, of uh, ecosystems, innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems, hence the connection of the reference in the title of tonight's presentation, the ecosystem as helix, uh, looking at the quadruple and quintuple helix and how these can help better understand and also from a design thinking perspective, uh, uh, shape and frame and implement a more effective and efficient ecosystems of in innovative and entrepreneurial endeavor. So this is a, a set of projects that we've worked on. Um, one concept I would like to stay with for a moment before proceeding is this of uh, knowledge serendipity and arbitrage, strategic knowledge serendipity and arbitrage idea. This actually relates, expands, and in fact helps articulate in a more structural, structural in normative manner, the ideas of exploration and exploitation that, that James Marsh and others developed over the years. And the idea is basically that depending on how rich, profound, connected, and dynamic and proactive a network or ecosystem you're part of is, and how open, transparent, and the culture is creative and sharing and all that, 
it determines the likelihood that you will discover something that you're missing without realizing at the at the beginning how important that may be. So without actually looking for something, you come across it. This is about serendipity. And then also with your knowledge and experience and that of your stakeholder partners, you interpret the implications and you understand and figure out how to best use it. This is at the heart of entrepreneurial endeavor, to develop, see around the corner, envision the opportunities, and also figure out how to implement the solutions that will be of higher value added and, and the potential fire profit uh, potential. So this is something I'm happy to further discuss. We're doing a lot of research on these ideas. They shape effectively how one should uh, design and implement ecosystems. They also have serious implications because our research has shown that unless and until an ecosystem matures, there is a minimum level of trust and respect, if you wish, and transparency. It is actually uh, opposing, impeding success for entrepreneurs. So when politicians uh, uh, channel a lot of money and resources in general to different uh, clusters or halls of excellence or what have you, original economic development projects, unless the culture locally and globally in that sense, in the particular ecosystem is mature enough and rich enough to facilitate this type of serendipity and arbitrage, uh, happy accidents as I call them, the monies will actually not only be wasted, but they may actually end up crowding out innovation. I don't have time to go more into this, but this is for me very important uh, because entrepreneurship and innovation are very significant uh, beacons of hope for the future and we should be very careful how we set expe expectations and meet them to feed and build trust and, and defeat and fight cynicism. Now, some projects in terms of publication projects, a list of those is here. I'll be happy to, again, to further interact with people. Um, there are different, uh, there's three journals, the Journal of the Knowledge Economy, the Journal of Innovation Entrepreneurship, Open Access, both with Springer, uh, and the Journal of Social Ecology and Sustainable Development with IGI, another publisher. They're all uh, more than 10 years old now and fairly mature and established. And there is also uh, projects like an encyclopedia on creativity, invention, innovation, entrepreneurship. We're just printing uh, the second edition. Uh, first one appeared in 2013, and this is a major reference work. And there is other handbooks, um, both uh, published and underway, a, a handbook on cyber defense, development, and democracy, and also um, with uh, Springer and also with Edward Elgar underway, a handbook on a artificial intelligence, innovation, entrepreneurship, and others. Uh, there is one more, finally, that I'd like to mention with Paul Grave, uh, the one on democracy, innovation, and entrepreneurship for growth. And there we try to look at and research what the, the influence of the nature of a regime is over the medium to long term, in terms of innovation, entrepreneurship, performance, and trends, meaning more are more autocratic or more democratic regimes, for instance, likely to be over the longer run, more successful or what? We try to be agnostic, of course. Um, so here's a brief mention on the one uh, handbook I mentioned briefly with El Elgar, Edward Elgar, uh, uh, handbook of research on AI innovation entrepreneurship. There is another one on digital transformation AI innovation. The brief uh, title for this one is Cyber Defense, Democracy Development and Diplomacy. So we're building in the, in, the, in the prior handbook I mentioned with Springer, we added diplomacy in there because I think they're all important uh, ideas uh, to reflect on and perspectives to look at the influence of cyber technologies and then in the context of different fields, defense, development, democracy, and diplomacy. This is the encyclopedia I mentioned. Um, this is the, these are the handbooks and there's a book also on cyber development, democracy, defense. Um, and now, uh, a brief mention on the broader context of our discussion. I'll let you for a, a few seconds here uh, review the text, but the idea is... Um, Ilias, I'm going to interrupt you here. I'm, I'm talk, I want you to just I talk a little bit about all these opportunities here and how they can reach you here, because this is so important. Okay. This, is, this is critical here, because you're part of the ICSP sure. family now. And as, as I mentioned in the chat that we're going to be doing more here. So okay. go, a little, so here, go a little bit over it and tell them, hey, I need submissions. Fine. I need ideas. I am happy to do that. I don't want to toot my horn too much. But here, 
Here's, first of all, the email that you can all reach me at. Uh, okay, you can see it at the bottom of the slide. Uh, C A R A Y at W dot edu, and then of course, as I mentioned, these are ongoing projects. There is another one in addition uh, with Edward Elgar also focusing on industrial innovation. Excellent. That one is another handbook, and this is in particular focusing on the industry uh, and society 4.0 to 5.0 transition in the more uh, structured, normative, as I said earlier, and uh, both institutional uh, as well as organizational. Uh, context and set of contexts and set of perspectives. So uh, let me let's go back to these since I'm on like me to be more uh, self referential here and thank you for the opportunity. Um, these are different projects uh, that effectively represent over the last uh, almost 25 years as I've been with uh, George Washington, my uh, academic research endeavors and insights and derivatives from those, I have been fortunate uh, to have developed and to have, of course, have had the opportunity to meet and make both friends and also have colleagues at George Washington, but also globally develop a network of uh, partners in research and stakeholders in different projects like those. Uh, all of these are indeed, each one, one could think of them as uh, not-for-profit ventures in effect. Uh, for, for, for me and the others involved on the content creation side, I guess, at least, not necessarily for the publishers. But uh, these are effectively ventures. And, and these are, as I like to say, a venture is a project. I teach project management, uh, emerging technologies, and new venture finance uh, um, at George Washington. And these are all interrelated and interconnected. Uh, a venture has a beginning and end in terms of the need to execute, implement the business plan, it has specific resources, and you better uh, be clear about what you need to accomplish and, 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 and coordinate, communicate, and, and um, uh, uh, configure and co-opt co your stakeholders, starting with your investors, of course, and your co-founders. So it is very much a project. And th the reason I say that is because this is how I approach all those things. I, I develop them as we start with an idea, uh, an insight, some motivation. In fact, many of those came out of, of the courses and the interactions with different audiences I've had with, at George Washington or conferences and so forth. Um, for instance, uh, there is a book series, the top one, Technology, Innovation, Knowledge Management. Um, for many years, over the last 20 years, in fact, I've been involved with knowledge management activities and the knowledge economy issues and the role of technology, innovation, entrepreneurship in this context, as well as science and technology, research and development. So uh, these, 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 were, these projects were the culmination of this set of interactions and the synthesis that emerged and the, 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 the derivative ideas and new knowledge, okay? And so I, I, thought of all, I thought of all those as platforms and means and modalities to help uh, capture new knowledge, empower, enable, incite, if you wish, and inspire people to engage and produce uh, content that is useful for everybody. Um, in fact, uh, one other innovation, if you wish, within the innovation that I could mention in this regard is, uh, the transition that I have proposed, in fact, the publishers, uh, Springer and uh, Elgar and others have been adopting increasingly, is to think of journals not as a, as a linear, static, incremental type of uh, uh, process uh, and, and a platform in that sense, but rather a much more um, modular, ecosystemic, if you wish, and dynamic uh, uh, entity that actually consists of a collection of what, what, what I chose to call special collections. And this is effectively a transformation and a derivation from the special issues that journals typically launch that have a beginning and an end and they're more like projects to something that will be more open-ended, more like a program more fundamental, of course, so we don't just do anything and everything. Special collections are meant to focus on, on important, salient, key, uh, transformative themes and ideas, such as industry and society 5.0. And then 
we have these open-ended and in the end, a journal becomes a collection of these modules or components. So this is just a brief comment on the procedural aspects, uh, the nitty gritty of uh, publishing and editing, but these projects, uh, again, emanated from research, the creativity, invention, innovation, entrepreneurship encyclopedia, uh, again, is a major reference work. Uh, I, I did it uh, over its two uh, iterations at this point, two editions to date with two different teams uh, of uh, four co-editors in each case, and we had, you can review it uh, at your leisure, uh, very many uh, contributions in terms of short uh, uh, articles or longer, so concepts, and then also longer uh, pieces. Um, by the way, another uh, set of synergies here that we try to drive is between Book series, uh, major reference works like uh, handbooks and encyclopedias, uh, journals, uh, and of course conferences. Uh, and they are all feeding off each other in that regard. The Journal of the Knowledge Economy, um, my uh, uh, main, if you wish, project is focusing on issues of the knowledge economy and society. and looks at how policy practice and theory can come together as well as politics to uh, shape hopefully a better tomorrow understand what the problems are in that regard um, the social ecology and sustainable development journal is another uh, effort to look at uh, the environmental aspects and issues and how that relates and connects to societal uh, dimensions and attributes um, we do have a component or an aspect that looks into the arts, in fact, and this is something that uh, is in collaboration with the uh, Vienna University for the Applied Arts uh, in Austria. Uh, the rector of that university is uh, my co-editor and working with others. We created the Springer's book series on arts, research, innovation, and society, and that also uh relates and connects it's, it's it's not just a book series it's a project in itself or a program if you wish that actually has its own webinars and workshops from time to time we used to meet in person now we probably have to do more online activities that celebrate new books in the series and discuss them and share them with the audience uh locally and and, and globally um i mentioned the democracy innovation entrepreneurship for growth book series uh, and then um, there is journals that focus on innovation, technology, and education, in fact, and a book series that they both, in fact, in a way anticipated the need to transition or the need to, to, to leverage and develop, of course, as I said earlier, a balanced technocentric and human-centric approach in designing education solutions that have to be clearly more online or at least hybrid nowadays, but they still have to make sure they actually serve the stakeholders and the students, first of all, and not become part, you know, not allow technology to become part of the problem. So, Ayman, if I'm allowed to, to stop talking about myself, let me continue with uh, some of the things I'd like to, to mention here. Um, make the world safe for democracy and make democracy safe for the world. So, these are, you know, I'm, I'm quoting President Wilson 100 years ago in the United States at the end of the First World War. And what's been happening over the last 20 years um, in the US and around us. And of course, the pandemic is an interesting twist in this uh, whole um, messy, but hopefully uh, also with some uh, rays of hope and promise situation. Uh, knowledge for development is a very important approach. And in this context, these are issues I'll come back to in the later webinars um, talking about exactly how you can implement uh, uh, industry and society 5.0 configurations and solutions and modalities and toolkits of this um, effort are things like what we call a smart city and different networks. They're all of course network solutions and by the way a recent McKinsey report that came out just a few days ago talks about how the, the, the network is the solution. And it reminds me of a quote uh, by Scott McNeely, someone I admire. In fact, I had the, the, the pleasure and opportunity to interview for my doctoral thesis um, uh, almost 30 years ago. <clears throat> he, um, he said that he was the founder, one of the co-founders of the 
Sun Microsystems, Stanford Unix network uh, company. It was later absorbed, but one of the major builders of engineering workstations. And he said the network is the computer. He said that in, I don't, I think the late 80s or early 90s. Uh, so you can understand, I hope, how visionary he was, okay? And of course, the strategic knowledge, serendipity, and arbitrage uh, effects and, and implications that I discussed already in this context of networks, of incubators, real and virtual, that are global and local in, in nature. This is actually part of the 2005 Technovation publication we have, the grooving concept. Okay, uh, so here's what Einstein said about imagination. And this is very important in the context of creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship. Um, uh, it's not about what you know, it's how you can envision the next thing. Of course, what you know enables and empowers your imagination, but you need to be able to think, as I say, beyond the box, not just outside the box, but beyond the box. This is really the culmination of, and the, you know, again, the celebration of the creative mind. Why is this important? Not just to make a few people uh, millionaires and billionaires, but because we have a planet that is shrinking in a way, and literally in that sense, in terms of the uh, destruction of the environment and the population that is exploding. So to have sustainable existence, let alone development, we have, of course, the UN 17 goals. In this context, this is a broader canvas within which we'll be talking about our industry and society issues. So industry 4.0 is technocentric. It is a set of modalities, technological modalities that you can see here, such as big data. Of course, at the top, systems integration, augmented reality, building on virtual reality, additive manufacturing, um, 3D printing uh, solutions, cybersecurity, cloud computing, autonomous system simulation, and the Internet of Things. We now are also talking about the internet of everything. And this is interestingly part of the interface between man and human and machine. And this is setting the stage for the industry 5.0 from technocentric to human centric. In fact, uh, if there's time I'll mention tonight and I'll discuss hopefully in the follow-up webinars, um, I'll, I'll mention the industry 6.0 paradigm that I'm also hopeful that will emerge at some point, um, which as we will see, is it's the again the um, culmination of the ramifications of, of uh, convergence and synthesis in a way and synergies of technocentric and human centric configurations. Where, when, and if that happens, technology will be really an enabler of a much much better tomorrow, will allow us to be truly free to think and create and not worry so much about uh, well. Uh, food security or environmental security or many other things. And that's certainly a vision and a dream. But the fifth industry 5.0 is certainly on, on the horizon. Um, you see the first, second, third, and fourth uh, paradigms. And in conjunction and connection with this is the society uh, 5.0 uh, paradigm that as you see the difference in the slide, in case you didn't mention it, you didn't notice it, um, and I need to mention it, it's from technocentric to human-centric, industry 5.0, society 5.0 is technocentric and human-centric. So it has a, a duality and a combination of these dimensions, um, and one feeds off the other, in fact. And as we have increasingly intelligent and truly finally becoming intelligent, artificial intelligence that hopefully also will observe and obey Asimov's laws, serving humanity and not um, hopefully enslaving it, will actually end up having a technology that learns from its gaps and mistakes and failures and improves uh, on, on an infinite scale and instant manner, hopefully. And this is more in the 6.0 uh, paradigm. So the new society, uh, it's exploring uh, and in a way transforming and evolving from a, a information uh, creating and sharing and using set stage to one of not just knowledge but also creativity and imagination and a more balanced set of conditions and modalities and in a more detailed manner it's about 
making lives better and society as a whole in a sustainable manner. You see the different types of technology, agri-tech, manufacturing technology, medical, fintech. Um, the pandemic in an interesting way has forced upon us both the challenges and the opportunities that these changes and transitions and transformations require. We have had to really um, rethink, think beyond the box perhaps and reinvent um, pharmaceutical and biotechnological R&D. We're talking, and this is not just about politics, of course. Politics is part of it, as I mentioned earlier, theory, policy, practice, and politics. Uh, the elections coming up, people are talking about the vaccine by November 1st. Well, regardless of that, the practice and the tradition and you know the good practices going through the three phases have really uh, in, the, in the past required several months and years, in fact, of research to, to come up with the vaccine. Let's say now we're talking about doing this in less than a year. And this uh, hopefully will be successful, uh, but this will be really a true paradigm shift that we're forced to go through. Uh, and, and hopefully my hope and, 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 and wish and prayer is that we'll not only see that, but we'll also see a new approach, uh, not just to optimize and maximize profit uh, margins uh, for companies, but actually try to really um, maximize the diffusion of benefits to the society as a whole. And this, this is a big challenge, uh, listening to uh, the World Health Organization and the United Nations in this regard. Uh, people are hoping and pushing for this, but there's tremendous effort at the national level and by individual companies. And this is, healthy and helpful up to a point. We need that, but we also need a balance. So what is, how do we achieve this balance? What is the context and the framework within which we can build uh, institutions and practices and initiatives that, uh, that are, again, uh, more, more benign and more humane? Um, this is where the quadruple and quintuple helix innovation systems concepts come in. They emphasize again and they embed in the planning. The European Commission has broadly and uh, I think uh, profoundly in many cases adopted and deployed these concepts and it's further doing so because they realize that through embedding them in the policies and the practices and so forth will make them part of not just regulations and bureaucracy but actually culture. Uh, and perhaps the European democracies are more uh, amenable uh, and easier adopters in a way of this type of thinking, but the hope is that on a global level, this will become more so. So the idea is that we have coexistence, competition, collaboration and competition, co-specialization, co-evolution, co-learning and co-creation of knowledge and innovation by government, university, industry and civil society uh, institutions and stakeholders that they all operate and try to develop solutions that obviously uh, allow for profits, but also allow for broader benefits in the form of public, uh, by private and, and hybrid goods, uh, protecting and respecting the environment. Um, in connection with this is the arts and the artistic research, which allows for creativity to thrive and help in the interactions and the synergies between and across uh, science, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, and the arts, <clears throat> you see very interesting uh, um, phenomena emerging and thinking beyond the box in a design thinking context is very much enabled by that type of approach. So in this same uh, theme, we see the role of democracy and ecology, environmental system sensitivity, important elements uh, of these uh, models and frameworks, and also the democracy of knowledge. Now, we have, of course, thanks to the internet, uh, these ideas of crowdsourcing, also crowdfunding, that in, empower, and the different social media tools, when they're not being abused or abusive, they empower and enable, in fact, this more democracy of knowledge, this participation on the broader level. This is part of the uh, vision for the industry and society uh, 6.0 paradigms, where the uh, all individuals and all citizens of different nations will be Power, empowered and powerful in that sense, stakeholders and participants and co-creators. 
we see here a schematic that shows uh, in brief uh, the triple, quadruple, and quintuple helix, how they're juxtaposed and they expand and build on each other. <clears throat> you see the knowledge economy at the core and the knowledge society and knowledge democracy under the quadruple helix and of course the social ecology uh, added for the quintuple. Corporations, as well as, as I said, uh, public bodies have uh, been adopting and using these concepts. Um, Intel, uh, this is a, a schematic that Intel developed. Uh, and by the way, um, uh, the helix concept is inspired by biology. In fact, the, the double helix that we all, in fact, are made up of. Um, this, by the way, is an interesting uh, development uh, I, I read a few years ago that actually in nature has been found that there is an existence a quadruple helix in any case these the, the, the helix concept or the helix design the blueprint is actually a very powerful one because it allows to maximize and optimize <clears throat> the interfaces across which knowledge is shared and exchanged. And this is what's happening on the natural level of the DNA. And then also, of course, we try to emulate and inspire that in our context. This is uh, the German uh, network of research centers, which actually also in the US and other countries, but it's German based. They also have their own view of the quadruple helix. <clears throat> and then the quintuple helix that builds and brings everything together uh, can be seen here in a three-dimensional gyroscopic uh, view, if you wish, uh, government, university, or academia, industry, civil society, and the environment. And that also uh, is shown from a top-down view. Uh, now, why and how is that important? A slide to briefly uh, motivate and explicate this. Uh, we have shown this in Oops. I apologize. This is in the rush to do things. I forgot to plug it in. Here we are. No worries. Um, this is um, a schematic, a matrix that shows how, if you look on the vertical, uh, government, university, industry, and civil society, the different the four pillars, uh, have different types of interactions and influences. And this is from a paper in uh, technological forecasting and social change. And that allows for a multi-criteria uh, decision analysis approach where we try to optimize again and push for both higher levels of efficiency and effectiveness or efficacy. There are technological, institutional, behavioral, and cultural uh, categories or types of, of variables and that we take into account in this regard. Uh, and you see examples here. So that sort of helps uh, uh, demonstrate how we, we implement this. Now, a couple of thoughts about future developments. Um, artificial intelligence and artificial labor, AL, AL is artificial labor, they will destroy. There's a lot of fear and a lot of, of course, um, sensationalism about, you know, huge levels of unemployment because of technology. Disruptions, uh, and for better or worse, are part of the norm in a way for decades or centuries, if you wish. Um, <clears throat> I remember uh, in the 80s, uh, people were, were destroying uh, Japanese cars because they were afraid, perhaps for good reason, that unless they change their ways and their products, auto, American auto industry will be extinct. And since then, China, of course, has replaced in many ways um, in sectors uh, the, the, the predominance of the U.S. and other countries. Uh, but there are, of course, uh, twists and turns in this way. You cannot be uh, projecting in a linear normative manner what will happen. So, uh, in fact, this is, um, we have a book in the Arts, Springer Arts Research Innovation and Society series on the future of labor and the future of education. Because education, obviously, is, as we all see, very much impacted and shaped by this. The second uh, hypothesis um, will, there's already, uh, for example, the wearables technologies in terms of, and actually also uh, different types of devices that some people choose to insert in the bodies. Um, some sort of evolution in a way, and without actually having some type of hardware uh, intervention 
the more we can develop and we're developing technologies that interface with the human mind directly. And this is a brief mention coming up about a favorite book and movie of mine uh, from 30 years ago called Firefox. This was about a plane the Soviets had developed at the time. The pilot could interface directly with the, the plane. It was uh, effectively an early instance of artificial intelligence in avionics. And uh, Clint Eastwood, who was the director and main actor in this uh, book, uh, rendition in uh, or rendering in in a movie, he tried to steal the plane for the the West. And the whole idea is how that actually has now become reality in many ways, and it's becoming more and more so, both in civilian and defense uh, applications. So uh, AI and the center concept of the hominid intelligence is another issue. And this is part of the industry elements of 5.0 and 6.0 and beyond. Uh, democracy, uh, knowledge and innovation, democracy and quality of democracy. So we've all experienced what happened with social media and the last elections in the US. Hopefully, this will not be a repeat performance, but uh, I do see that there are influences and changes in the quality of our democracy due to technological, the uh, you know, onset and advent and <clears throat> and, and uh, you know the, the, the tremendous uh, disruptions as well as benefits of technology and AI in particular. So. We need to be uh, mindful and uh, proactive and aware of what's happening and what may happen further. Uh, technology may empower democracy, but may also well empower autocracy. Time will show. Um, <clears throat> we had this interview a few years back and uh, with a colleague of mine that I'm authoring many, uh, many uh, research pieces. And, and the point here is that our fundamental belief and premise is that true and transparent democracy constitutes sine qua non, an indispensable element for smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. Um, and this is a motivation, justification for the quadruple and quintuple innovation helix frameworks. That actually is becoming increasingly true for the um, industry uh, four and 5.0 uh, configurations and society 5.0 in fact because this actually uh, is where we end up uh, needing uh, and, and requiring in effect to ensure that empowerment of uh, the many not just the few will come from technology and that also relates directly to education goes into uh, how we can educate the masses, and there have been many interesting experiments with uh, massively open online courses and uh, the open um, content initiatives that uh, many large universities in the U.S. <coughs> have established uh, over the last few years, MIT and Stanford and others. Um, to basically allow people around the world to have access at least to a basic version of the knowledge and the know-how, not just the knowledge that they convey to their high paying clients, of course, and the more uh, fortunate uh, ones that can attend. Uh, I think there is a significant implication here, and there's one slide later on where I talk about natural versus artificial uh, abundance versus uh, scarcity. And this is from a book on smart growth I wrote 15 years ago. It's very pertinent today, in my opinion, because this is very much about how technology can help either drive artificial scarcity or achieve abundance and get to situations like in the Star Trek series of the Replicator where they didn't have currencies and this is not promoting any kind of a, a Marxist ideology, not at all, but they didn't need currency at, at, at this, in this series in this sci-fi science, science fiction context because they had everything they needed on demand through technology, uh, starting in with food. I don't know about the taste of pizza, but uh, so you see here the different types of, of revolutions, first, second, third, and fourth, and how this has been happening in the context of not just uh, significant speed, but also acceleration of innovation. This is a very important aspect of the phenomenon of innovation 
as I described it earlier, socio-technical, socio-economic, socio-political. As all of these aspects come into play and interact with each other, they drive change in a way that is increasingly fundamental, path-breaking, and unpredictable, as well as disruptive. You see here, telephone took 75 years to reach 100 million customers, Instagram two years, and then Pokemon one month. Um, these are, I think, profound observations. Um, you see the building blocks of 4.0, we already discussed that earlier, and just a, a repeat, a brief mention, because that will take us into how that 4.0, setting the stage for the 5.0, impacts all aspects of the value chain. And you see here all the different elements, uh, enterprise resource planning, uh, IT infrastructure, materials, digital manufacturing, and so forth, and how that actually uh, helps digitize the value chain that has serious implications or, or for another uh, theme that will be part of the future webinars, um, business models, digital business models and business model innovation that builds through design thinking on producing new solutions. Again, trying to think beyond the box to achieve abundance uh, in a manner that is not just sustainable, but also profitable. Uh, so here's the 5.0 context. Again, the more human-centric uh, balance versus the technocentric uh, aspects. And some comments about this here, uh, focusing on interaction between humans and machines, improved integration, faster, better automation, paired with the power of human brains. Again, the ultimate, and the, you know, the, 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 the Culmination again is the direct interfacing and reliable, of course, and and transparent to all in the end, interfacing in the same manner that electricity is available to all today, it wasn't so 100 years ago, and in a reliable manner, hopefully most of the time. But the the, the interfacing of, man, of humans and machines, um, what robots in that sense will do in this context, they will help close the design loop. They will help. Uh, again, they will be part of a solution, not the problem, and they will become increasingly transparent, again, in the same manner that uh, electric power or other such technologies that telecommunications are nowadays more in the background. Um, so we're talking about, and we all are aware of robots that are not just the manufacturing ones, it could be in the house. And also, of course, we have uh, the potential for robots at the, at the nano level whether it's about surgery or whether it's about all kinds of other things, uh, monitoring and predicting and preempting uh, disease or other um, desirable effects um, or phenomena. Um, the idea, again, these are all the optimistic and positive perspectives. There's all kinds of risks and uncertainties involved in this. Um, Marrying high speed and accuracy of automation with the cognitive critical thinking skills of human staff. So increasingly aiming to produce more creative machines. And of course, what does that mean? Um, there's an interesting survey by Accenture. And of course that was before the pandemic, but they anticipated 85% of respondent, respondents uh, foresaw at the time, which was like four or five years ago, that human machine collaborative environments will be commonplace by now, 2020. So this is in itself interesting. It's happening, but it's clearly not happening as fast. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is how can we interface with the brain directly? There's a lot of interesting developments, technologies, and projects in this area. And hopefully will not just be we will not sort of uh, robotize or, or uh, mechanize the mind. We'll actually hopefully make more human and creative uh, technology and machines. Um, I mentioned the Firefox earlier um, <clears throat> and the concerns about unemployment. The issue here is that you will need to have the capacity, the skill sets to be not a programmer in the traditional software development sense, but rather a, a, a highly uh, skilled uh, medical, for instance, professional that will also be uh, highly skilled and proficient and familiar with technology of this type. Uh, some comments uh, coming towards the end here on the industry 6.0 vision. Uh, I referred to 
the fifth century before Christ of Athens, the golden century of, as at least history reports it, of philosophy, democracy, and other things. Of course, we should realize and remember that the few fortunate at the time were also uh, relying on the other technology that we know of. At least they were relying on human slave labor. So we need to be mindful of the implications. Again, that's why we focus and emphasize the balance and the the fourth and the fifth dimension in the quadruple and quintuple helix, civil society and the environment. Um, as pollution uh, is increased, you end up effectively denying basic human rights, like the right to breathe and the right to clean water to people that cannot afford to technically solve the problem of pollution. Okay, so pollution is not just an externality, it's a threat to democracy in that sense. Hopefully with technology and in this uh, vision or dream, real virtuality versus virtual reality, I call it, corruption and waste <clears throat> and pollution uh, and other such inefficiencies will be significantly mitigated, if not extinct. And the idea is that we'll have machines producing machines and the problem in, in that context at that point might be more what we'll end up doing with our time than um, how we use it creatively and constructively. Um, <clears throat> but there, of course, again, uh, as Star Trek said, space is the ultimate frontier, right? So um, quantum computing, uh, resource management, we could end up, again, having some type of replicator solving our problems. And this is what brings us to this uh, two by two in terms of natural versus artificial scarcity versus abundance. I'm paraphrasing uh, Nobel laureate from physics, Leah Prigozhin, who talked about as a book, in fact, from being to becoming, and I have this title. I used this, I mentioned in the book in 2005, re referenced in the, the bottom of the slide uh, with Macmillan. From socioeconomic being to techno-economic becoming, and I have a question, three question marks, in fact, in terms of whether this is the onset of the era of cyber prosperity because we, in the same manner, we can hopefully move from natural scarcity towards artificial abundance. We can have a transition from natural abundance to artificial scarcity, either because of pollution or corruption and other gains that uh, often <coughs> uh, stakeholders, private, but also public play, to introduce scarcity and maximize profits for the few and or make changes that actually end up uh, I'm reminded, for instance, end up not being beneficial to the broader, uh, for the, the broader good. Um, I'm reminded of a project in Africa years ago, pursuing cleaner water. Uh, there was, of course, water of lower quality, but available to many in the country. A project by International Development Agency that we'll not name here actually ended up uh, <clears throat> through partnership with a private uh, company in the water sector, uh, producing high quality water that was also, of course, uh, now sold at a price and was not available to many or as many as before. The few who could afford it, of course, had very high quality water, but uh, uh, that wasn't necessarily the actual solution needed. Um, in terms of AI, uh, this remains a challenge and this is going back to the uh, Turing experiment, uh, whether you can tell that I'm, machine or computer inter interacting with you is actually a machine or a human. Um, so this is a twist on that. Um, and a brief mention on the differences between machine and human intelligence. Um, that's where the uh, delineation between the, the, the machine-centric and human-centric designs and configurations uh, is defined. Uh, sensing data, environmental scanning, memory, creativity, and emotions, obviously, as we go from one to five, <clears throat> the humans have the advantage still at this level and substantially so. Um, how we change is really how, about how we learn. And there are three types of learning that are now increasingly being embedded in artificial intelligence, algor intelligence algorithms and modalities and tools, uh, supervised and supervised and enforcement learning uh, the implications for the applications of AI uh, 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 as shown here in this uh, topology 
having at the core deep learning as it's called, uh, which is basically um, uh, high level learning and changing how you learn. Um, and then applications that are ANN, as we call them, artificial neural networks, uh, enabling, empowering this deep learning, and then also machine learning, and then artificial intelligence at large. And this, by the way, uh, is my, uh, the beginning of my journey in the area of starting learning. In the both technological, technical, uh, AI, computer science context, but also in an organizational context, in my thesis uh, 25 years ago, 26 years ago now, was actually about higher order learning in organizations, uh, a triple learning, triple level learning configuration, learning, learning to learn, and learning to learn how to learn, in fact. So these are about not just changing your rules, but developing entirely new strategies about how you change your rules. And this was a, a, an effort to envision at the time how to build in practices and rules and regulations and organizations to drive this higher level of performance, more effective and efficient uh, achievements. But now it's become interestingly a part of AI, AI modalities and tools and increasingly diffuse in the background. And that's a good thing, I hope. Of course, we also have the big brother uh, and that's in closing, uh, taking us back to Plato, talking about philosophers versus kings, um, and how the leaders of our democracies to begin with need to be philosophers, otherwise we'll be in trouble. That's not just about education and upbringing or breeding, if you wish, it's about mindset and, and, and fundamental, at the fundamental level culture, inculcation. And then the other part is about systems and systems thinking and understanding that we're all connected, whether it's about the, nat the natural environment or society. And this closes this um, uh, presentation uh, for today. This is just a couple of slides with references for people that may wish to look at them. I'm happy to further uh, discuss and engage. Ayman, are you still there? Yep, I am. And um, let's go back to the in initial slide. If you want to show the initial slide as well, that'll be guy. Let's go back to slide all the way back to up here. What I want to do is I want to open it up um, and for any questions from anybody that has here or reactions here, because we covered a lot here. But I, let's let me start with this whole dem democratization of knowledge, Ilias. I, I talk a little bit about this while I while the other people are writing some of their questions and comments here. Democratization of knowledge is a very sure, powerful, and it's a of, very powerful term. Yes, and of course, you know, uh, Eric von Hippel, <coughs> Anna Marie um, wrote about this years ago. Uh, you wrote a book. Um, uh, what's the title now? The um, it's about uh, innovation and, and democratization of innovation, I guess. And that's related in some regard. It's about enabling and empowering more to be, first of all, knowledgeable enough to be able to understand how to use technology, but also what the implications and the potential of that is. And then also to have a voice and to be connected with the different uh, networks and the different uh, environments uh, that are, whether policy uh, making or just simply community interacting and developing. So democratization of knowledge uh, relates to both uh, how knowledge is created and shared and also how or what you can do, how you can use that knowledge that you should have more access to. Uh, the, the, the voice, how your voice could be heard and how you, you, you could become an influencer, not <clears throat> necessarily only through the known nowadays. And I think the term itself is abused uh, use of social media for all kinds of things, and some of them, or many of them, perhaps silly, but also how you, you, you all can become or should be influencers in our, in our own right as uh, citizens and participants of, of democracy. So democratization of knowledge in that sense is a very fundamental enabler and, and protector even of democracy. So there are many complex solutions or many complex questions that require knowledge for solving or addressing them, that unless we possess them, 
for instance, vaccines and vaccination. Uh, it's not just about creating a vaccine nowadays, it's also whether people will want to, to be vaccinated. And there's a lot of uh, theories, let's say, and a lot of, of uh, perspectives on that. I don't want to politicize this at all, but but because I have a lot of uh, medical doctors in the background, uh, you know, it's they find it appalling that people uh, would uh, avoid or refuse to be protected from very real and very lethal threat if yeah. the, you know, the vaccine were there. And Ilias, I'm, I'm, I, I know you, you like to kind of sometimes push the ideas to the edge here. So I'm gonna push more on the edge here and ask this question here. What I've seen in the past, and I, I think I also will mention a colleague of mine that mentioned this to me here, is right in the past when we when when we see when we hear of something that is evil that is that was badly done or hurt people, and we heard about it, or we read about it, or somebody told us about it, but it was always one off. It was always either we read about it, heard about it, or someone told us about it. But what has changed is now everything is visible. Now we can see everything instantaneously on the screen. A video comes within seconds of something happens, right? And it shows up in our, in our cell phones. It shows it up on our laptops. There. Go ahead. It stays too. It's not just visible. It is uh, almost, uh, how should I say, an, uh, non or unerasable. Yes, even that's a great point. It's not even it's not even erasable. You can't just kind of discard it because you don't know where it is. It's always there. So when when the title Society 5.0 and, and knowledge, you know, and and, and knowledge, but you know, the, this whole thing of 5.0, right? Is it then? Is it that this whole concept of that we see things, we, we visualize things so fast that it's impacting us on how we acquire knowledge and process knowledge? Um. Yes, but again, uh, it's more than that in my mind in the beginning. And what is really in my mind potentially more significant is, as I said at some point, the implications for theory, but also policy practice and politics. In other words, uh, <clears throat> what hopefully will continue happening and actually there will be qualitative and accelerating transformations uh, with broader impact. Uh, and again, this is the optimistic uh, scenario. There will be clearly mishaps and unfortunate de derivatives that I hope and believe we can control. But the idea is that we will increasingly see that people become increasingly influencers, they become increasingly empowered. Um, this is already happening. I, I mentioned at some point, uh, democracy safe for the world and vice versa. and we all know what happened with the Arab Spring. Well, up to a point, the social media and the advent of these technologies um, really allowed change, even if people, you know, have a conspiracy mindset uh, and they believe that external influence, influences and powers uh, acted, agitated to bring this kind of abrupt change. Uh, autocracies were brought down because of now, what happened afterwards doesn't, you know, you know if there were failures after that, doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, erase or invalidate what happened. So there is tremendous potential promise as well as risks in that regard. And that's just an example. I, I mentioned the research for vaccines development. Mm -hmm. um, and there is competition, there's collaboration and competition on a global scale in this regard. The reason we have been seeing results on a such accelerated basis is a great, to a great extent, the fact that we have <clears throat> the potential, and we've, we've had this over the years, but now because of the risk and the danger, it's culminated uh, the potential for these happy accidents that I mentioned. So we, we are witnessing strategic knowledge, serendipity and arbitrage happening in front of our eyes. The, the researchers, the different research teams, are interconnected. What we see appearing and being presented to be as the product and the ownership and the property of Sanofi, uh, Glaxo, Smith Klein, or whatever the other companies are, Moderna and what have you, is really uh, a public private good. And in fact, there's been a lot of issues uh, recently about intellectual property rights and other things. 
about who owns really what and what kind of research has been enabling this and many parts of that research has been publicly funded. So the issue is that <clears throat> these communities of interest and practice of experts are really another example of stakeholders, influencers, of course, that in their own way are so profoundly and richly and closely in, in this way uh, connected. Uh, so this connecting effect that the world is the network or the network is the world. I yeah, I, I like that. Um, that let me, to me is this industry and society 5.0. Go ahead. Let, let me ask this question and it's probably, you probably think it's like a minute question here, but it, from a philosophical standpoint, it might be very deep. Um, I've noticed in the last, let's say, year, one year, and I use um, Google a lot, right? And I'm not sure if you do or not, but some of you do. But when you start crafting messages on your Google or your email account, the, the, the system starts to write the sentence for you. Have you noticed this when you're writing? Yes, the system, the system uh, knows you better than you in some regards. And this is scary to think about it. Um, you make me, if I may, refer to uh, another research that we have ongoing and we have a publication that I'd be happy to share if people are interested on uh, ambidextrous cybersecurity and the seven pillars of cybersecurity wisdom, as I call it. And this is with IEEE transactions and engineering management. And these seven pillars, seven words starting with P, uh, they, they include things like preventive, uh, preemptive, and predictive. So, uh, of course, semantics and other AI tools uh, for security uses and all kinds of other uses, marketing and what have you, are observing us all the time. Uh, the Google engines, as you articulate these questions, as you're thinking, are reconfiguring your profile. And of course, uh, think of what may start happening uh, when the technology is actually reading your mind, literally. If yeah. So, so the question broader interfaces. Let me let me finish this to scare people enough. Discussion. <laughs> if we start, uh, if we start getting to the point where this is mature, now we have issues. Hey, the machine or the phone, the smartphone is listening to me or whatever. Well, think about actually of that these things being able to read your mind. You know, whether it's alpha waves or other types of, because we are electromagnetic entities in the end. So we have. We have, we have a trace, we have an electromagnetic uh, signature and a trace, and as we think, the chemical reactions in our brain actually uh, produce uh, some type of uh, result that can be, can be captured, can be observed, can be converted into information. So that, uh, you know, I, I had a slide that I actually deleted uh, referring to, to, a, to, to, a, to a German poem from the 30s. The title was, the Gedanken sind frei, the, the, the thoughts are still free. And of course, this was at a time where, where fascism was on the, on the rise globally. And uh, in, in some regards, we should be worrying and wondering perhaps, but again, I choose to remain optimistic about the potential of technology. There are significant pitfalls. But, but okay, but, but, there's, but there's two parts of it. One part, there's a good part and there's a bad part. So let me, let, yes. me start with the, let me start with the good part here. And I'll give you an example here. Um, is that, you know, and I'll, and I'll give you this. I received an email that was basically a little bit frustrating. Okay, and we get these, right? The person was maybe a little bit inappropriate in the way that they wrote the email and the tone. And our human reaction, when you get something like this, not all of us, but some of us, is to respond back with the same tone because you're not really appreciative of the way they crafted the email and so on. But what I realized here, and consciously what I realized here, when I started writing, the system toned down what I was writing. Okay? Like, because like a car will break if you're driving, uh, you know, uh, recklessly nowadays. Yes. Uh, Exactly. It, it's somehow, you're not it's, allowed. You're not allowed to be stupid or self-destructive anymore. Okay. Yeah. Yes. The email. The email basically put breaks on 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 certain things that I was doing, and I realized, and I smiled, and I said, "This is fascinating. It's it's the computer or the laptop or the intelligence was modeling my the tone of what I should be writing." So, so okay? when when you're getting ready to consume your tenth hamburger, uh, there will be a robot <laughs> to come and stop you, I guess, and take it away. 
Yeah, well, okay, let's, okay. Not, let's not go that way. Right? But oh. on, the, on the other side here, the, the other flip of the coin here is that this was not authentic, that we lacked authenticity because it's not you that was writing. It was somebody else that was oh. writing on your- How do you know it's me? talking to you all this time. <laughs> now we're getting so, into the matrix. Well, this is, this is the, the Turing, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, there have been movies, and this is art imitating life or life imitating art issues too. There have been movies in the past, I think mm -hmm. Eagle Eyes or something, I don't know. Uh, in, you know. Some of them were science fiction where technology took over and it emulated people, it, you know, and going back to the Minority Report, a movie from the late 90s about, uh, you know, arresting people who had the potential to become criminals, but who had already offended. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, no, these are... So, what do we do? This thing is happening. It's here already. So, we need to figure out ways, like the, the General Data Protection uh, regulation, the GDPR, that came out of Europe in May 2018. This may be uh, protecting privacy, enforcing a change in many things, uh, along with the, the revelations about the social media abuse, not only in the U.S. elections, but elsewhere. I mean, this, this is why we need to be uh, uh, um, uh, both proactive and uh, aware and participating and knowledgeable to be able steer things in a better direction. I have no other... Uh, yeah, no, no, it's, uh, we, I know this is the start of the webinar series here. So I raise these questions here. I know people are getting... We some can of, come back to them. Yes. yes. And then I think we're over time here. So what I'd like to but do... There are some people who wanted to ask something, I think. I don't know if they still do, but... Um, I think we have... I saw a hand. Did you see... Who raised their hand? Let me see if somebody raised their hand. Um, if you'd if you like to put a question... I hope it was Google. I think Google was, I think Google moderated their question here. Um, uh, no, I think they they um, they had to go here, but um, so let's let's end it here, Elias, because we want to keep it on Fine. time. But we'll come we'll come back with the questions here. And I last very much comment. appreciate it. Hmm? That last comment. What would you want to leave us with? With the last thought. What 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 that might be? Well, um, I really, if I may, go back to the. Uh, last slide, uh, the quote from Plato, uh, and that not, that's not just about kings or, or, or presidents in the, uh, just uh, bear with me please here, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the narrow formal sense, because in our own individual context or domains, we are, the, in some regards, the main influencers, how we design and deliver a course. We need to imbue and embed <coughs> philosophical mindset and thinking in how we approach things. And that has to do both with ethics and values, as well as uh, what does it really mean to be human, especially in the context of uh, an increasingly artificially intelligent uh, era. So we need to make sure that we maintain, as you said, authentic humanity in the context of an increasingly artificially and technologically intelligent world. That would be my takeaway point and hopefully a motivation yeah. or a springboard for future discussion. Um, this, were, this has just been absolutely fantastic. I know we started the series here, so we'll continue it there. And I want to thank you, Elias, again for all your time. I want thank to thank you. you all for joining here and then um, we'll be in touch. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.